Nature, it seems, has a thing about symmetry. When we encounter it, it makes us smile. When we seek it out, we find so many forms balanced and ordered, aligned and precise. We love this. Children and adults can lose themselves staring into the endless shifting symmetry of the kaleidoscope. But why? Why do we love a building like this, regardless of its size? It's the symmetry. Why have centuries of artists equated beauty with symmetry? In ancient Greece, Aristotle wrote, the mathematical sciences particularly exhibit order, symmetry, and limitation. And these are the greatest forms of the beautiful. Symmetries can be rotational or radial, like a bicycle wheel, which looks the same after we rotate our vantage point around a single axis. Reflection symmetry occurs when two halves of an object are perfect mirrors, like the butterfly. One tip of a symmetrical snowflake tells us something about all the tips. One petal of the lotus teaches us about all the others. And one cell of a honeycomb allows us to understand the structure of an entire hive. With symmetry as a guide, a complex system can reveal itself, be made simpler and easier for us to understand. Knowing the symmetry enables scientists to make predictions, as Einstein did when he published his theory of general relativity in 1915. Symmetry operates at many levels. Young German mathematician Emmy Noether lived the asymmetry of being the sole woman in a world of old men. She was a Jew in Nazi-occupied Europe, but she found a stunning symmetry in her equations. She formulated what we now call Noether's theorem, which says that any symmetry we see in nature has a corresponding conserved quantity. That symmetrical bicycle wheel, for example, keeps its rider upright due to conservation of angular momentum. Experiments confirming the predictions of Einstein, Noether, and others have convinced many scientists that symmetry is at the very heart of our understanding of the universe. They've proposed an even deeper space-time symmetry called supersymmetry, which describes a world in which each particle in nature has a superpartner or companion particle the newly upgraded CERN Super Collider in Switzerland, the race is on to test that theory. Symmetry has always entranced our eyes and minds, but is it also a clue to the deeper order of the universe? So you're gonna give up a summer day to think about symmetry, huh? Are these even? Check, tell me, are they, are they about right? Are they about right? Yeah, let me see. Um, my shoes, are they the same? I got up, you know, early this morning. Are they the same shoe? Because it's so annoying when you pick the wrong shoe and they're different. Let's see. Come on here, ma'am, would you stand up? Would you stand up, please? Stand up just for a moment. Yes. All right, anyone wearing a, a maroon uh, top? Today, great, isn't it? You were married. You were, so stand up together. So you're, you're symmetrical. Doesn't, doesn't that annoy you when you go in and someone's wearing the same thing that you're wearing? Isn't that? So symmetry is like something we love, but it's also something that's annoying sometimes. I mean, symmetry, symmetry. I mean, symmetry. Listen, listen to symmetry, right? <laughs> symmetry. I mean, if all music was symmetry, ugh. So it is our mission here to get involved with symmetry and also asymmetry, because there's an interesting, there's an interesting set of properties to both. Um, for instance, if I were to you know, get rid of my, half of my face here, you could predict what the rest of my face looked like simply by your expectation of symmetry in my face. But if you literally made my face the symmetric mirror image of this face, you'd get it wrong, because there's a slight sort of, it's not quite symmetrical. And it's that not quite symmetrical, but expectation of symmetry, the, we love the beauty of symmetry, and asymmetry altogether, which tends to be a little bit frightening. Um, 
that, that we want to explore today. Um, hello to all of our friends around the world, our streaming folks here at the World Science Festival. Yeah, I was in Brisbane. We had the festival in Brisbane uh, just a few months ago. And just to give you a sense of how processes in nature and, uh, say, for instance, politics uh, move along a continuum and that what seems stable at a certain point seems very unstable at another point, and instability in politics in 2016 seems to be a very... Um, uh, symbiotic relationship, shall we say. Um, but but it's, it's funny, I, in, in Brisbane, I would, I, would, I would not even have to mention any specifics about what was going on in the United States in March. All I'd have to say is, we're having a little problem in the US, and the audience would go insane. I mean, they just thought it was funny, funny, hysterical, and you know, anything even coming close to discussing the candidates in the uh, American presidential race produced all sorts of, you know, what are you Yanks doing up there? And, uh, uh, but a few months later, I mean, you try to make a Trump joke in America today, you get groans, you get, shut up. Stop it. I've, I've stopped paying attention. I'm watching Game of Thrones, that's all I'm paying attention to between now and November. Um, people are a little weary. Um, and it's that sort of ebb and flow, that back and forth, that swinging of the pendulum, that's also an aspect of symmetry. We have symmetry in objects, we have symmetry in people's behavior, we have asymmetry in people's behavior. Um, and, and I think the, the narrative of symmetry is what we want to focus on here, and the uh, power of symmetry in physics is truly a power that we're going to uh, explore and understand with some truly amazing and fabulous characters here that we've... Uh, gathered. I will grab my little symmetric. Oh, yes, the wrong font. It's totally asymmetric. I'm completely annoyed. Our first speaker, though, Robert Digraff, mathematical physicist and director and Leon Levy, professor of the U Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, has made important contributions to string theory and the advancement of science education. Please welcome Robert Digraff. Speaking of asymmetry, just look at the spelling of that name. Whoa, I tell you. Man needs to buy a vowel, don't you think? Um, also with us is writer, astrophysicist, and educator, professor of the practice of the humanities at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's also held a position as a theoretical physicist at Harvard University. Please welcome Alan Lightman. Our next guest, guest is a physics professor at Caltech. She's been researching elementary particles and their interactions at Fermilab's Tevatron and CERN's Large Hadron Collider. Please say hello to Maria Spiropoulou. And our next speaker is the Chancellor's Chair, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He was awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of asymptotic freedom, which led to the formulation of quantum chromodynamics, David Gross. So, um, lots of ways to talk about symmetry. Robert, what are the different types? Uh, well, I think your symmetry is, in some sense, the most approachable part of mathematics. You see it all around. I think we saw in the video already the, the typical symmetries that you have in space, which is reflection, uh, it's rotation, like the petals of a flower, it's uh, translation, like a, a checkerboard pattern. But, uh, I mean, mathematicians dig deeper. There are, uh, there are symmetries, as you already indicated, in, in time, repeating patterns. But you can also think about symmetries which are out there, and you're not pr probably aware of it. For instance, if you have a bunch of particles that are all identical, you can kind of interchange them. And that's a deep symmetry too, uh, but you can't really visualize it in terms of a, uh, a, a visual pattern. And the, the great thing is that mathematicians actually have made this ter terrific effort to kind of make a list of all possible symmetries. So there's a whole mathematical field there, group theory, that uh, allows you to systematically explore these symmetries irrespective of exactly how they're realized in nature. So uh, the quarks, the standard model which resulted in the quarks, the so-called eightfold way and yes. group theory. Group theory basically is this way of predicting 
uh, the, the, the nature of those particles. That's, it comes directly from mathematics. It's, uh, the mathematical framework was already there to order, and I think that's in some sense why in particular I think you know, physicists love uh, symmetry and group theory, because it's a way to order nature. And sometimes we see it very visually in terms of these wonderful images, but actually it's uh, this uh, terrific adventure that we have been on that that same kind of ordering and that power of the mathematical framework is operating at each level of nature, even at the very most fundamental one. In all these books about, you know, the universe, I mean, Brian Greene, elegant universe, you know, it's got to be beautiful or else we're a little annoyed by the whole thing. Um, <laughs> is this symmetry thing a restatement of that or is it more complicated than that, Maria? Um, I think it's, a, it's a far more complicated than that. I think... Uh, and not to say anything against Brian Greene, it's illegal actually to do that. I know, we are in, <laughs> we are, yeah, we are yeah. in Brian's yeah, game. Right, Brian are, is yeah. extremely elegant exactly, and yeah, beautiful. The, the so security guys we... will keep me in here in five seconds. But <laughs> yeah, please, yeah. Go ahead. He's perfectly symmetric and yeah, beautiful yeah. and elegant. But, 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 but um, to, to state something about, uh, about elegance and beauty um, and talking about the mathematics of it is something that touches more the, the realm, I would say, of truth. And to say something about our universe, the real universe, is to say something about breaking the symmetry, breaking the beauty and the aesthetically pleasing math, and actually going to a complex universe, the <coughs> universe that we live in. And, and in that sense, um, because the universe is not made of one particle, but it's a system, I think the, the going, from, going from the predictivity of symmetry to the reality of what we observe, we usually have something that, uh, that breaks the symmetry. And I think that's an, a very important concept and interplay between symmetry and symmetry violations or symmetry and breaking of symmetry. And we very much appreciate that because the universe we observe is, is neither totally symmetric nor I, totally ideal. If it was, uh, it would be made of massless particles. So there's, there's an expectation of symmetry, a description of a sort of symmetrical system sometimes in physics. Uh, we, we get close to the answer, it breaks, and then it gets reassembled. That's where the Nobel Prizes come, right? The, all the Nobel Prizes come when you reassemble. Uh, you, you get the broken symmetry, and then you reassemble it, and then you're the, you're the big winner. Is that how, is that how it works? <laughs> so um, there are symmetric objects which we admire and we find beautiful. But the most beautiful thing of all are the symmetries of the laws of nature. The laws are not easy to describe. They describe the regularities of the events and structures we observe. They're not butterflies. But without the symmetries, we probably could never have discovered these laws. The symmetries of the laws of physics organize the regularities of the laws themselves. For example, one of the fundamental symmetries that Robert referred to are the symmetries of space-time. The fact that the laws of physics are invariant, unchanged, when you translate in time or in space or rotate space. That is essential. Uh, it means that an experiment that I perform today in New York or tomorrow in Santa Barbara, I get the same answer. It means that if I publish a paper reporting my experimental findings, I need not say where I did the experiment or when or in what direction my laboratory was facing. It will Imagine, just cost more in New York and there'll be better weather in Santa Barbara. <laughs> so the laws are hard to describe. But we do have the weather. databases yeah. in our experiments. So. But when we isolate them from these um, irrelevant factors like weather, then the laws, the regularities become evident and the symmetries. The, one of the reasons I was thinking when you were sh show that beautiful video of symmetrical objects is how rare they are. Most situations in the world that we observe are totally asymmetrical, including your face. This room is totally asymmetrical. You're there and not there. And yet if I do an experiment facing this way or this way, I get the same result. States of the world are incredibly asymmetrical. The rare symmetrical ones we therefore appreciate more. The laws, however, are always symmetrical. 
when we talk about symmetry breaking, we're not breaking the laws of physics. They have this incredible symmetry. And you know, it was only about a hundred years ago, Einstein first stated that fact in that way. Before that, much as that video represented, symmetrical objects are kind of beautiful and we find them in nature and they're useful. They make our descriptions simpler, etc. Einstein came along and put symmetry first, the symmetry of space-time. And then the symmetry of space-time that is sort of independent of the particular dynamics, the particular laws of physics. And in fact, he used those symmetries to severely constrain the possible laws that you could have. It's a total revolutionary approach and one that has proved extremely useful to follow in the 20th century so and the, has led to many Nobel Prizes. Right, right, exactly. And the recognition of symmetry constrains the, the, the set of possibilities, um, the mathematics, uh, its difficulty in resolution, um, but still leads us down a path that we understand is to uh, basically confirm laws that are invariant. Um, it gives, it prohibits certain possibilities beyond any particular theory. It tells us, if you have a new set of phenomena you want to describe, you must construct an explanation that is consistent with these underlying symmetry principles. Right. That's very constraining. And uh, of course, those principles could be wrong. Those symmetries could be wrong, and we must always continue to test them. But many of them, like time translational invariance, which leads, as Nether discovered, to energy conservation, or translational invariance that leads to momentum conservation, or rotational invariance that leads to angular momentum conservation, have been extremely well tested over centuries. So they give us guidance to formulate dynamical laws of nature. All right, so we're pretty smart in this era, but in, in, the, in ancient times, there was a lot of discussion of symmetry and how has that evolved, Robert? Well, I mean, it's kind of fascinating that the, the, the Greeks, they were totally uh, fascinated with the mathematics of these regularities. And so I was, was wonderful that you know, the high point of Greek mathematics was the study of the platonic uh, solids, which are, uh, we see some of them here, they were perfectly regular object made out of polygons, identical polygons. And the fact that there were only five was already uh, important element, and they tried to match it with, at that time, the theory of elementary particles uh, of ancient times, which are like the four elements. So <laughs> they so like, well, the, the pointy-shaped uh, tetrahedron, that must be fire, and the icosahedron, which is the most rounded object, would be water. And it's amazing that like the fifth, the, 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 the uh, dodecahedron is kind of this, made out of five-fold polygons, uh, that actually was, didn't have a place in terms of the four elements, and so they considered this the fifth element, quintessence. So that was <laughs> the element out of which the rest of the world, the, the universe was made of, outside of planet Earth. And I think that's in some sense, it's like totally wrong, but it, it shows in some sense already the kernel of thinking that you now these kind of, this powerful mathematics could actually be used to describe the world. So in a kind of metaphorical sense, I think they were on the right path. Uh, and I, th I think if they would be back now, they would be kind of shocked on the one hand how different our theories are. But actually, as David was just saying, I would say the concept of symmetry and groups describing that symmetry is even much more at the heart of our description of nature than it was at that, at that time. Although we can, we can be fairly certain that if Aristotle was alive today, he'd be more likely to buy a Tesla than a minivan. <laughs> <laughs> right, in terms of yes. symmetry and yes. beauty and the yes. sort of the curves and all the yes. sorts of things. One is more Arist Aristotelian than the other. Alan, um, in many ways we are confronted with the question, why? Why have symmetry? Why? Why? To just make us feel good? To, uh, to, 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 to make things beautiful? To, is it it's some sort of aesthetic quality? Uh, is there any particular reason why there should be symmetry? When we're confronted with that question, why in nature does symmetry seem to be an efficient or useful way of uh, constructing uh, structures and uh, processes? Well, um, in terms of physics, 
uh, I'll speak first about that. Uh, the history of physics has shown that, that symmetry, uh, the, the theories that have more sy symmetry tend to be conform with nature. Um, it, it, uh, it's, it's also beautiful, um, but besides the beauty, um, there, there are very deep connections between symmetry and the logical consistency of nature. In fact, it may be logically impossible to, to build fundamental laws of physics that don't have symmetry in them. Um, as far as uh, objects of, of, of nature, uh, why is a soap bubble spherical? Um, why is uh, snowflake have, have six-sided symmetry? Uh, there's often an energy principle operating in nature. That nature likes to, nature I think is an ongoing, constant ongoing experiment uh, all the time and uh, if certain outcomes require less energy, uh, they tend to be favored. Um, a, a planet is, is round because it, uh, a round shape minimizes the gravitational energy. Uh, a soap bubble is round because uh, it minimizes the, the surface tension energy. Um, if you look at, um, at animate nature, um, uh, an example that, that I find fascinating is the honeycomb of bees. Um, and you can ask, uh, why is it that, that the honeycomb of bees are shaped, each cell is, is a perfect hexagon, or almost a perfect hexagon. So why is that? And uh, the answer to that brings in uh, all the principles, mathematics, economy, least cost of energy. Um, it turns out that there are only three uh, shapes that have equal sides that can be, that can be fit together, that can, can be, be passed packed. together. Right, without uh, spaces in squares, equilateral, equilateral triangles, and hexagons. So that's a mathematical truth. And so... And the hexagon gives you more space to cram stuff into those little... It, it, it does. Yeah. So the question is, uh, why do you need, um, uh, if you're a bee building honeycomb, why do you need to have uh, these shapes that fit together perfectly, only the square, the triangle, and the hexagon, why couldn't you just make irregular cells, and I'll make an irregular cell here that has lopsided sides, and then the next bee comes and makes an irregular cell. Um, well, the problem there, if, if each cell has to be custom fit to the next one, then the poor bees have to, have to wait in line to make their honeycomb. Each bee has to wait for the one before it to make its cell so it knows how to make its cell to fit the previous one without leaving gaps because gaps would be a waste of space. And, and also introduce, introduce bacteria and All kinds predators. of things, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so uh, so uh, to make things sequentially, to, to have all the bees working at the same time, and if you've ever see, seen a, a beehive, the bees working, they don't stand in line waiting for each other. Or if you've seen a, the bees working in a YouTube video, um, they don't, <laughs> but, they don't but stand in line. It's not the case that uh, you know, there's some old bee that sits around and says, you know, years ago we used to have irregular cells in here. Right. <laughs> and then you know, this guy came up with hexagons, and man, was he a genius. Right. You know, I mean, it's not that way. It sort of always was the case. They, I mean, well, they, they figured out over evolutionary periods. That's why I said nature is an ongoing, constant ongoing experiment with lots of things trying out being tried out, and just like the principle of survival of the fittest, the, the, the plans that, have, uh, that cost the least energy, that are the most economical work. So, so the hexagons or the, the, the squares or the, or the equilateral triangles are the shapes that fit together so the bees don't have to wait in line for the next bee to do its thing. So then the final question is why is it the hexagon and not the square or the equilateral equilateral triangle. And that's a very interesting story, too. It turns out that, um, that of those three shapes fitting together uh, in the honeycomb, that the uh, hexagon has the smallest total perimeter. And the smallest total perimeter means the less 
wax uh, that the, the bee less amount of wax. needs. Oh, that's interesting. You know, for every ounce of wax that a bee uses, it needs eight ounces of honey. Well, that's a lot of work, and uh, you know, the bees like to economize, like the rest of us, they like to save energy. So the hexagon is the mathematical shape of those three that has the least perimeter co covering a given amount of area. So, We've well, talked a lot about how math yeah. predicts symmetry, and, and, and you, know, you don't need to know math to understand how math and symmetry go together. I will try not to completely embarrass myself here, but, but everybody understands. <laughs> that these sounds seem to go together and are pleasing in some way. And what do you expect? You know, it's coming, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's the five to the one. The two. If I were to... <laughs> you would go, huh? What? Um, and in fact, sounds like these are not symmetrical, they're asymmetrical, or they, they break symmetries within the harmonic series that um, produce tension and create all kinds of possibilities in music. But the mathematics in music, the, the symmetry of the harmonic series and the fact that, that we have a certain set of feelings associated with hearing sounds in some combinations and, and other sorts of feelings in hearing sounds and other combinations is just an example of how bound up in this mathematical principle so many aspects of our, of our consciousness is. And music and math were believed to be the same science, in fact, uh, years ago among, among the ancients. Um, how does math and symmetry in math, you've described it at least uh, uh, briefly, uh, predict the kinds of symmetries that physicists deal with? Um, well, I would say that uh, the, uh, there are two parts of uh, that, that question. So one is, in the, what is exactly the role of symmetry in physics? And David already uh, talked about that. But then the second point is, what exactly are the symmetry groups that nature uses? So I think the fact that uh, mathematics in general is underlying uh, physics is, uh, and our description of reality is a great gift, I would say. It's not, not in any way obvious from the very beginning. Uh, it's uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, people joke that, you know, physicists try to find out uh, what laws God picked for our universe, and mathemat mathematicians try to understand the laws that even God has to obey, you know, because it's the, it's the general patterns. And so what- Mathematicians are kind of arrogant. They're right? very yeah. arrogant, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they, as I said, they make basically big lists of all possible structures that are there. Some of these are realized in nature, others are not. Now we uh, just talked about the symmetries of our space. It's space in three dimensions. It's very easy to imagine symmetries in four dimensions or in 100,000 dimensions. And so all of this is possible in, in, in the mathematical world. So part of what mathematics does is also produces, in some sense, uh, you could almost say like a big encyclopedia, that has all the possible mathematical and symmetrical structures there. And then it's up to, I guess, experiments or some, to find out what are the particular symmetries that we see realized in nature. And we talked already about the symmetries that are kind of visible in terms of our space and time. But of course, great other discovery was that some of these symmetries are in a domain that we can't immediately visualize, which are more the abstract symmetries of particles. Simplest one is, for instance, we have particles of charge plus negative and positive charge. Now, you could do a symmetry where you interchange these two charges. That's what you call negative, it's certainly it's positive, and what's positive is negative. Difficult to visualize, but it actually is, again, almost a symmetry of nature. So, in, in that sense, the uh, I think we are more convinced of the fact that symmetries play an important role in general, and then it's up to, I think, experiments, et cetera, to find out what particular symmetry groups are there. But for the mathematicians, it's all fine. You know, they, they just study the structure in general, and they're not that much worried about which particular instance of a symmetry is realized in nature. There's, uh, go ahead, David. <laughs> right, I think uh, Robert, 
I've talked about uh, generalizing the notion of symmetry from the space-time symmetries, which we've mostly been, uh, to symmetries of the constituents of matter. <coughs> These, are, in some sense, are symmetries of the labels we give to distinguish different constituents. Particle, antiparticle, one fundamental symmetry of nature. And, um, but what, is, what do you mean symmetry? This was one of the great triumphs of quantum physics and relativity when Paul Dirac discovered that taking those principles, symmetry of relativity and the quantum mechanical world, putting them together, predicted that for every particle in the world, every constituent of matter, there had to be an antiparticle. Okay, that's a symmetry. Particle, antiparticle, same mass, same properties, but opposite charges. It turns out that the understanding of that symmetry is one of the deepest facts of nature we know. It is the fact that nature has inherently no direction of time. If you take a movie of what goes on in this room and run it backwards, it looks kind of weird, right? There is an arrow of time that we all feel, we grow older. But at the microscopic level, there is no arrow. If you run the picture backwards, particles are going like this. Run it backwards, the particles are going like this. But a particle of positive charge going forward, you run the movie going backward, looks like a particle of negative charge going backwards. So for every particle of positive charge, there must be one of negative charge. Dirac was astounded by that prediction, disturbed by it because no one had ever seen such a particle, and nobody at that time, unlike today, was in the business of predicting new particles. And, yeah. and yet, and yet, so this is, this is exactly that, and this is a very deep, extremely deep and insightful way of, of, uh, of predicting particles. Yeah. We're going to have a copy of that when we talk about supersymmetry, but what I wanted to say here is, is that despite this, in, um, in, in fact, in 1933, when he gave his Nobel Prize talk, Dirac, he said, and therefore, he, I predict that there will be Earths and galaxies <laughs> and systems and maybe people made of antimatter. And guess what? This is not the case. There is a matter antimatter asymmetry, that it is the fundamental um, asymmetry in the universe. So the universe essentially picked sides. The, the beauty of the symmetry in the actual fundamental theory is not manifested in the solution of the problem. The universe has picked sides, and the universe is made of matter. And this is a very deep mystery that we try to actually understand the source of this uh, picking, picking sides in the universe. Well, the, you can see an example of this charge quality that exists within symmetry and also understand the traditional sort of um, identical uh, mirror image idea of symmetry on your own face. Let's put the um, facial symmetry graphics up here. Um, uh, symmetry is our idea of beauty. We have two faces here. Um, which is uh, more beautiful? Hmm? <laughs> They're not identical, but can you tell why? Can you tell how? Put the second faces up. <laughs> They're the same person. They're not identical. Is one more beautiful than the other? That's unfair. It's actually a cheap shot. We don't want to go there. But, um, <clears throat> but in fact, this is an artist who takes uh, the uh, mirror image of faces and makes identical faces of the left and right. So you have two left faces on one side and two right faces on the other side. Go back to the male. You can see if you look carefully, you've got the exact symmetry of the pimple there on the chin, yes. right? right? Which indicates it's a fake, because we don't expect exact symmetry, we expect close symmetry. So, in a sense, the right face and the left face are not identical copies of each other. Go back to the female. They're negative and positives. It's almost like they're charged, they're, they're 
face and anti-face, and together they form a face, and that's sort of the ultimate beauty. There's something a little freaky about yeah. this one here, um, and just as there is here, and just as when you see your inverted image in the mirror, there's something a little strange about that. Alan, why is um, symmetry perhaps an attractor in biology and uh, something that keeps the species going forward, the, the kinds of things that uh, you know, we're attracted to uh, encourage reproduction, for instance? Well, I think uh, for, for the more intelligent uh, animals, um, uh, that, that symmetry is associated with order. And I think we like to, to find order. The universe is a very strange place. Uh, it's confusing. Uh, there are all kinds of, of phenomena that we don't understand. And to, to, to find order, uh, I think, is, uh, gives us a certain amount of, of security and stability and sanity. I think also that symmetry uh, is associated with, with with beauty, and uh, well, we've said that. But does symmetry specifically encourage mating, for instance? Well, well, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> I hope that my wife is not listening to this. Is she um, asymmetric, <laughs> <laughs> or not beautiful? <laughs> well, actually, um, uh, art historians. Um, I'm thinking of Ernest Gumbrich, have have analyzed our aesthetic. Um, this is getting off the track a little bit, uh, what our aesthetic is, and it turns out that what we like most is mostly symmetry with a little asymmetry mixed in. And it's sort of a balance between boredom and confusion. If everything is perfectly symmetric, and this is including a work of art, um, we find it boring. I mean, I found that picture of the Taj Mahal, I don't know whether we've, sh we've shown it yet, um, is, is, is boring. Um, on the other hand, if everything is, is random with, with no symmetry at all, we're confused. And so you want to, to sort of navigate between boredom on the one hand and confusion on the other. So that would be Trump and, and Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> we need that. I, I knew that we were going to get around to Trump eventually. Yeah. Just, uh, I, I want to say something about biological <laughs> systems that I read recently, which I thought was astonishing. So in, uh, in the humans and in most creatures, the heart is on one side, and we don't have half people have hearts on the right side. Similarly for the fish. Now, when and similarly, the cochlea that we, show, that we saw on this uh, shell, Inside of a shell yeah. on the seashell, it has a helicity. On most of the shells, it's the same helicity. So there is, uh, there is experiments what that have been done. Helicity is the way it, the, which side you turn it, clockwise. you turn the cochlea. Clockwise. This side, right, right mm. clockwise okay. or anti-clockwise. And, and if you do a genetic experiment where you change the heart, and it has been done of, little, of a little fish, you change it on the fetus, and it goes on the right side, the, 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 the fetus of that fetus will still go on the left side. There is a very recent experiment of somebody who changed the helicity of the cochlea on, an, on a beginning cell of a cochlea. So she managed to actually have the counterclockwise, and then she, she looked at how the, the, um, uh, the, the the, out, the, 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 the children of this will, will, con, will connect. And they went back to the previous helicity. So in this case, also nature picks sides. It's not, it's symmet the object is symmetrical, but there is a picking of sides in the realization. It's not free for all, or everything symmetrical in that sense. So imagine, I was astonished about imagine that. Imagine the amount of therapy that mollusk would have needed. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, isn't it true that some biological processes depend upon helicity? Exactly. Well, so, so, and so, as, 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 so this would be another case say, where, yes. where natural selection and survival of the fittest and the constant experiments of nature uh, decided that it's good to have 
one helicity and not have random right. helicities. Right, and sugar, for example, you have a sugar that gives you zero calories, but it doesn't exist, you can sy right. synthesize yeah. it, but it doesn't exist in nature. Mm -hmm. The one that you have in nature is the one that gives you the calories, and there again, you've got right. a break, a, a picking side, in a uh, sense. A long time ago, uh, calories were actually important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, they still maybe are. less so, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's get back to math for a second. Uh, we've talked about you know the uh, uh, honeycomb and the hexagons and the, the, the sort of polygons, the, the, the classic sort of basic figures in geometry. Look at fractals for a second. What kind of symmetry, uh, Robert, is, 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 a, is fractal geometry? Well, that's also very deep symmetry, and that's uh, you know, fractals have this, pa this, this kind of wonderful uh, property that if you kind of zoom in, they look the same. And so, so they're at, symmetric at scale. At scale. So that's another kind of symmetry that we are not aware of, which is just the symmetry that we kind of can zoom into nature. So we can look at some of the laws of nature and can see actually what happens if you look at smaller and bigger sizes. So Earth is not symmetric at scale. The more you zoom in, the more different the, yes. the, the, the uh, uh, objects and, and uh, processes you have. Yeah, but you can do, again, and I think this is something that David made this incredibly important re remark at the very beginning, is that we, we study the laws of nature that have these kind of perfect symmetrical properties, and then we look at the realizations of the laws, and they, are, uh, they could be all over the place. And, and in fact, I must say, you know, we have seen many, many images of symmetrical objects, but if you're really honest, none of them are truly symmetric. Nobody has ever seen a perfectly symmetric snowflake or flower because there's always something wrong. It's only in our minds, in something in our mathematical minds, that we can produce the perfect circle. It's impossible for somebody to put here on this table a perfect sphere because I will just zoom in. It was all be one little atom out of line. So, in, 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 in some sense, everything we showed, all the examples are kind of wrong at the microscopic level, it's the, it's the, it's the fundamental principles. Is it the case that, that symmetry is a blueprint and that the actual realization the, of objects implies a certain asymmetry? Well, objects are made of atoms, so yeah. a perfect sphere would have to be a continuum of atoms, which doesn't exist. The laws of nature, however, some laws, we believe, have this perfect symmetry, or at least we haven't found violation. Now, the laws are indeed mental constructs, and mental constructs can be, it appears more perfect than uh, objects that we construct these mental constructs to observe. But, you know, I, I want to say one word about a, a different kind of symmetry, which is even weirder, that totally um, dominates our thoughts nowadays, which is a symmetry of our description of nature, not of the laws of nature. How can, let me explain it. it the symmetries we've been talking about, like rotational symmetry of space, means that if I do an experiment facing you, and I do an experiment facing you all, I get the same results. I rotate the laboratory, the laws of physics don't change. We now have something we call gauge symmetries that are the foundational idea of our standard theory of particles. Gauge symmetry. symmetry. Gauge symmetry. Right. Sometimes they're called local symmetries. These are symmetries not of the laboratory. I don't, when I perform these transformations, these rotations, I don't change anything in the world. I change my description of the world. In some sense, they're not really have nothing to do with nature, but have to do with the way we describe nature. And for a long time, until the middle of the 20th century, we're regarded as some kind of mathematical gimmick. And to be said, ah, that's not really a, just a, it's a symmetry of the way you describe nature. And in fact, that's kind of true. It's kind of a redundancy of our description of nature. And one of the most profound things we've discovered, and I don't think it's really permeated very widely outside of physics yet, is this, it seems that to describe nature at its core, we need to create a whole redundant set of uh, variables. And in the most, the weirdest thing of all, that dates back now exactly 100 years, is that that's the most revolutionary contribution of Albert Einstein. 
he taught us that space-time itself, the coordinates we use to measure positions or times, are redundant variables. And underlying the theory of gravity is a invariance principle that says you can go to choose a different set of variables, a different observer, a different coordinate system, and the laws of physics are unchanged. You're not doing anything to space-time, but rather to your description of space-time. So there's a very deep, deepening notion of symmetry in that some way, it, it, it's a wrong metaphor, but it's a little bit re re related to your remark that if you see the left-hand side of your face, you have seen enough, because you can essentially reconstruct the right-hand side. If you look at a snowflake, if you see one-sixth or one-twelfth of the snowflake, you can reconstruct the rest. The fact that symmetry is boring, that it allows you to kind of, uh, kind of squash information into a smaller place. In some sense, it's, it's a very efficient way to capture information. That's really happening with these... Uh, these gauge symmetries, and again, you know, it's e even it's easy to fall into hyperbole. But you know, we, we think of symmetries. I mean, a big symmetry is a symmetry that you have many different reflections, that many movements. These gauge symmetries are, I would say, the biggest symmetries we we have discovered because it basically tells you you can at each point in space and time, you're free to do these rotations or whatever these kind of very abstract mathematical operations. And uh, so from that point of view, our description of nature is like this gigantic snowflake, which has all this kind of excess information in it that we kind of can, can, can get rid of. And using the mathematical ideas, just as we reconstructed the second half of the phase from the first one, we were able to reconstruct all of physics out of that kind of very small amount of information. I mean, yeah, go ahead. And in fact, just to, just to connect again with the gauge, with, with what David says, how important that is, when we talk now about the forces of nature, gauge bosons are what we call the carriers of the forces. And uh, the, the story of the Higgs, in fact, uh, is, is a story that involves the gauge bosons, the other gauge bosons, the W, the Z, and the photon. And when you try to build from electromagnetism the bigger part of the theory, which is the electroweak theory, the, the Game of Thrones drama there was how to get massive gauge bosons. The theory initially with its beautiful gauge symmetry was giving massless gauge bosons. And together, at the same time, together with what um, was known as the, 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 the Goldstone uh, bosons, there were, there were, it was a fight between what we were not observing in nature that we should have been observing given these symmetries uh, that led to the whole understanding of the, of the Higgs mechanism, and Brian will tell us about that, I gather. But the gauge, the gauge, the underlying gauge symmetries of the standard model is just a supreme mathematical victory, I would say, for how you can use the language of mathematics and the intuition of the physical world to actually describe uh, nature. So, um, Mr. Nobel Prize-winning Gross, um, asymptotic freedom. Um, this is uh, the the principle that that uh, you carry the prize for, and we are all in your debt as a result. Um, how is that? A, and we've been talking about description here and limits of description and how that sort of sends us back to the drawing board. Is it the case that when we see the limits of symmetry, it sends us back to the drawing board and we have to sort of re-evaluate things and then uh, come to a new set of understandings? Is that what's going on or is it something fundamentally different? Yeah, uh, so this, it, it is a story of symmetry and symmetry breaking to some extent. It is the symmetry that Robert was talking about, the symmetry that you brought up with fractals, scale symmetry. What are we looking at here? Uh, oh, actually, <clears throat> here we're looking at a picture of the vacuum. So uh, symmetry breaking um, is not hard to understand in a sense that, you know, rotational symmetry is broken in this room. You're there and you're not there, so. You know, you're there, but if I, if I removed all of you, and us, and all the air molecules in this room, and you were left with nothing, that's, that's our name for the, the vacuum is our name for nothing, the state 
the ground state, the state of lowest energy that contains no particles, all fields are turned off, there's nothing there. I imagine that your mental picture of the vacuum is just sort of blank, dark, you know, black, nothing happening, just empty. And that looks awfully symmetrical. There are no objects, there's no difference between looking at the vacuum this way or that way. But in a quantum mechanical world, the, this is a picture of the vacuum. This is actually a pretty good illustration of the vacuum on the scale of the proton. The proton, this screen is about twice the size of a proton. So we can't actually see it with a microscope, although we do explore it at the LHC at CERN with particle colliders. And we deduce theories, and then we do simulations of those theories, and we make these movies. And that describes fluctuating fields that hold the quarks together. So, but if you look at this vacuum, it's pretty complicated, and it's messy, and it's not at all obviously rotationally invariant. Or, and it's perfectly possible to imagine in such that complicated vacuum doesn't possess the underlying symmetries of the laws of that whole of, of uh, physics. And that's what spontaneous symmetry breaking means. The, not this room, this room is not symmetric rotationally because you came in that side and not that side. But the vacuum is not symmetric because it's a complicated dynamical medium in which things might turn out to point in a certain direction and not in the other direction. So, so this you know, is sort of the metropolitan opera kind of metaphor for order, right? And that would be maybe a downtown club, um, the vacuum. Right. But Chaotic. This is the vacuum. By nature. But this is not... So it is common that you have symmetry and then you start adding energy, people running in, dancing in all different directions and looks very asymmetrical. But you now go to the... You remove everything, all the energy. You go to the most ordered possible empty state and it's still asymmetric. Right, right. So, and that complicated vacuum, in fact, explains why you can't pull quarks apart. But I'm, How I'm it's thinking, related to yeah. symmetry is that it, if you look at this vacuum, I said it's the size of a proton. There's a certain scale of those fluctuating blobs there. Mm. That scale that's only produced because of this asymmetry defines, creates the scale of the proton. Were it not for that, if the vacuum were boring and asymmetrical, you would have this scale invariance that Robert talked about would be true. And no matter, you look at quarks at any scale, they would behave exactly the same. There'd be no difference. Mm -hmm. But then there could be no objects of a given size. The world would be incredibly boring. Every microscope, better and better microscope, you just see the same thing over and over again. It's the breaking of that scale symmetry produced by this vacuum, this kind of vacuum with a dynamically produced scale that produces objects like protons, atoms, Diversity. Us. The diversity that structure. we see. Structure. Structure. Right. If you have no scale, you can't have structure. Right. Robert. Well, one thing I find that's kind of amazing from this story is that, and almost going to the beginning of our discussion, we see this nice kind of symmetrical object in nature, and then we learn, well, they're very exceptional, and actually, honestly, they're not really symmetric. So then it looks like symmetry is like a naive concept, because the world has looked very complicated. Yet we discovered, say, in the last hundred years, again, at the level of our fundamental laws, symmetry rules. But we have to understand that it's almost like an acquired taste because you don't see it immediately around you. The world doesn't look like a, a honeybee uh, come or, or any, anything. We've, not, uh, we've noticed. Yeah. And, and, and that actually is, uh, I, I think that's why it's such a terrific uh, uh, achievement of science to discover these laws, because they're not transparent. We are not, the world is not a big snowflake. We had, in fact, it's almost like hi hiding these symmetries, and it's only through this combined effort of doing experiments, very deep thinking, the 
analyzing the mathematical structure, being sensitive to this subtle taste of nature, that we discovered that nature is symmetric in a very fundamental way. However, doesn't sh she doesn't show it in a very ex explicit way. In fact, understanding the way YC isn't ex showing this explicitly is, helps us understand the world. But it's, it's not that the concept of symmetry has been kind of moved to the back side. I would say it's like it's front and center in our thinking. Is the multiverse the idea a, a yearning to understand <laughs> this symmetry and symmetry breaking, Alan? Um, could I go back first yeah, sure, to sure, sure. something earlier? We, we've invoked the name of Albert Einstein a few times, of course. Um, and I just wanted to, to clarify exactly what the symmetry was that, that he proposed in 1905. Um, symmetry in general uh, means that when you make a change in a system, that everything still looks the same. When you rotate a snowflake by... Right. 60 degrees, it still looks the same. And what Einstein proposed was a symmetry of motion, that you, you have one person sitting in this room and does experiments with, with uh, bouncing balls and swinging pendulums and uh, electricity and magnetism, and you have another person who's moving by the first person so at a different motion, so the change in the system is we've moved now the laboratory. So the laboratory is now moving, the second laboratory is moving. With a constant velocity. And that person does experiments with bouncing balls and swing pendulums and electricity and magnetism and gets the same results. So that's the symmetry, that, that motion does not change the results of the experiments. That was the symmetry that Einstein proposed and that led to uh, the special theory of relativity, uh, which, as David says, is built into all of our physics today. But it started off with the, with the symmetry principle, that motion, uh, yep. in this case at constant velocity, does not change the results of doing an experiment. So that was the symmetry principle. It's really a, almost a philosophical principle. There was nothing, there was not a lot in physics up to that point that required that. There were some experiments with, with, with magnets and coils of wire, but um, I think a, a lot of things that, that Einstein did were, were based on partly on philosophical principles, which I think is also why he didn't like quantum physics, because it, it, it rubbed him the wrong way philosophically. <laughs> but, but you know, he didn't want to call his theory the theory of relativity. It was somebody else gave it that name a few years later, and he really didn't like that. He wanted to call it a theory of invariance, theory of mm. symmetry. He, he knew that people like the, that was taken. the that postmodernists was taken. might misuse <laughs> yeah. relativity as they did. That name was already taken. He worked in a patent office, by the way. He probably knew. <laughs> um, you asked me about so, the multiverse. Do you want to Yeah, go uh, on we'll go back to that in just a second. Yeah. Um, since we brought this up, and since you described that so perfectly, these two laboratories in motion, but isn't it the case that if you tried to observe what was going on in the moving lab from the stationary lab or the lab at the other, uh, it, it, would, it would, if that was possible, what was going on with the bouncing ball and the pendulum would look bizarre to the person in, in, the, in the other lab, or would they see the exact same no, thing? No, it wouldn't look bizarre. Oh. It, 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 would, it would obey the same laws of physics. It, the, 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 the laws governing those, those, the bouncing ball at swinging pendulum would be the same. Uh, Asymptotically, as, as the velocity, he, he talked about constant velocity, as the velocity goes to the speed of light, then things would look bizarre, then clocks would go, in one case, faster than the, or slower than the clocks of the, of the not moving system. And so you saw that, you saw that in uh, Interstellar where McConaughey said, uh, you know, <laughs> hurry up, you know, seven minutes here, seven hours, seven years on, on Earth time. So this type of uh, bizarre phenomena, but the invariance nonetheless, when you take space and time together, and that was, that was brilliant, it's not just any more space invariance or time invariance that we're talking about, it's the both. Ah. And that invariance holds again um, together. That's quite a remarkable step, because in all the processes we saw, where you take the snowflake, you rotate it in space. 
But we never rotate space into time or time into space because they're totally different ideas. Even. And so that was, in some sense, the mathematical underpinning of that theory where transformations, where space and time were mixed, which looks like you're totally confused. Uh, but actually, that's what physics tells is, is a symmetry. It's a very deep symmetry. It says that space and time should be together. It's a four-dimensional space, space-time. And so the fundamental symmetries that we study in physics are actually not rotations in three dimensions. They're rotations, equivalents of rotations in this four-dimensional object. And that all of that describing. came from the, uh, the, the hypothesis of Einstein that, that systems should look the same whether they're moving exactly. or not, that, that you can't describe motion by itself, that the two laboratories in motion relatively to each other measure the same things. And that led to the, the, the fact that space and time are intimately connected because motion, speed, when you think about it, it's distance travel divided by time. So when you start having things that involving speeds, it brings in space and time together. Let's jump for one second to the multiverse because I think a lot of people are, have understood and have heard this concept of a multiverse. You describe it in uh, your book, uh, uh, your previous book, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm, I'm wondering if that is a yearning to restore symmetry in some way, to create a symmetry that maybe uh, the mathematics doesn't, doesn't give us, at least right off the bat. Um, how, does the, how is the multiverse idea a way mm -hmm. of restoring symmetry? Well, I've never thought of it as restoring symmetry. Um, the, the, we have uh, theories of physics like string theory and eternal inflation that actually predict the existence of lots of other universes with different properties um, uh, and that our universe is only one random throw of the dice among all the possibilities. Um, I suppose that you could think of that in terms of symmetry and that all of these different uh, universes uh, are possible like the different faces of the exactly. of, of a of, yes. a, of a die of of, of a uh, and uh, that maybe you need all of the different possibilities in, in order to have a complete symmetry. I think that uh, for me the most compelling argument uh, to believe in the multiverse um, is not the predictions of these other theories which are largely unproven. Uh, but to explain the reason why our universe appears to be fine-tuned to allow the emergence of life. Mm -hmm. That if you just change the parameters in our universe a little bit, like... <laughs> disagree? <laughs> yeah, he's ready to get up. Okay. <laughs> he he's going to be out there in the <laughs> audience in a minute, yeah. Go for it. Um, well, I don't really... Um... I, I disagree so violently that I, <laughs> you know. Um, Please disagree violently. I, I like the, that idea. I li I, I fi there are many technical objections to the statement that string theory or current theory uh, predicts the existence of uh, many other universes, which by the way, are a-causally connected to us. There is no possible way of observing them or them affecting us. It smells of angels to me. Um, <laughs> but take, but you're pushing this even further to anthropic arguments to explain uh, facts of, observed facts of nature that we're not yet able to explain. Uh, like, for example, the fact that uh, were it not for the bizarre circumstance of ice having less specific density than water, the oceans would have frozen and life would never have... Now, that's unusual for a liquid when it's frozen to be lighter than a fluid state, and it's hard to calculate. But we have a pretty good theory of atoms and molecules, which actually has only one free parameter, as we discussed previously, the, the magnitude of the electric charge. And by now, 100 years after quantum mechanics, more or less, we are, um, physical chemists can actually calculate 
the uh, properties of water at its freezing point and show that it follows from th this rather good theory of atomic physics and molecular physics with one parameter. What about the value of the dark energy? Now, you're asking me about a theoretical puzzle, uh, why the cosmological constant is so small as it is. Uh, that is one of the most serious challenges to physics, theoretical physics, um, and you know, it, it, probably the hardest one you could ask. There are many other small parameters that inform us that our, our present theory is not strong enough to, to uh, explain such incredibly small numbers. There, by the way, are similarly small numbers that we have explained pretty well. Uh, Max uh, Dirac was wondering about the fact that the, why is the mass of the proton, the mass of hydrogen atom, uh, 10 to the 19th power smaller than the basic Planck scale. Uh, this theory, by the way, we were discussing before QCD explains it. So we've done it before. There are actually three examples of numbers that are as small as the magnitude of the dark energy that modern physics has succeeded in explaining. But let's, so let's, you're presenting one very small number and saying this requires the existence of an infinite number of universes which we never can communicate with, and we live in the best one where we, life can exist. I find that a, an enormous challenge to the successful history of physics. I, I didn't say it was the best universe. Well, <laughs> <laughs> The only one where life can exist. There's, of course, a more mild version of this uh, multiverse, but just in our own universe. I mean, that we, we've been speaking all the time about breaking of symmetry. So if you look in the world around and you ask, so why is it as it is? And I must say, just the fact that the universe is so huge, that there are so many stars, and perhaps and we, don't, we have no idea how big the universe is. We know how big the observable universe is, but it probably it runs on for quite some time, or some, some distance behind that. It just means that these, exp these kind of, this finding this particular kind of local environment, that experiment is done over and over and over again, which I feel is a good thing. It means that if you look in your environment, like the, the old days people would look at the, the planets and would wonder, you know, why do we have so many planets and why are their orbits as they are? And we know that we don't need a fundamental description of that fact because there are tons of stars and tons of planets. We're discovering them all the time. And so that's almost kind of restoring, in some sense, a principle of, I want to say, kind of democracy, or in fact, symmetry in the sense that all the possible, possible re, uh, states of nature are actually realized in our universe. In our universe, because there's such a, a huge yeah, amount of structures Yeah, it means it doesn't, doesn't there. put a lot of pressure yeah. on us, because we're just one of perhaps right. an infinite. And let's and avoid... And in any case, just to ground a little bit with the experiment, we don't, everything that we observe so far, we interpret very well within the construct of the universe and without a need of multiverses. So the data that we have ground us in that, unless those... Of course, as David said, if the multiverses are not connected with us, are not called, we cannot, in, in other words, we cannot get signals from them, then we go into fantabulous speculation about uh, all the vastness of the multiverses. But experimental-wise, we don't have anything concrete to, to support anything like that. Although it's probably the case that Google and Facebook need multiple universes to keep their business model going, <laughs> possibly. The, the multiverses and, of the human, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, that's a, exactly. that's a right. big story. All right, so let's get to particle physics here for, for a moment, um, because in many ways, the symmetry of, of what we love and butterflies and all this sort of thing is, is uh, just a doorway into understanding something that's much more complicated, and that is the ways in which symmetry informs the research into particle physics and how we are at a very exciting time in terms of where symmetry and particle physics are at this particular point. Um, David Gross, we've got strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and gravitational force right now, right? Is that a symmetric system, or is there an asymmetry there that forces us to look for something else or other things? Well, the fact that you had four names is obviously asymmetric. And we, um, it's like four pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. If I give you four pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, or 40, and you put them together, you know, most likely I didn't give you all the pieces, and there were a few holes. 
these pieces actually fit together, and that was evident 30 years ago from the beginning. Three of the four. Three of the four fit together beautifully into a sort of a obvious jigsaw puzzle. And people then extrapolated that and discovered that it, you know, if you really could look very deeply inside matter, you that even gravity fits into the picture naturally. That's what has spurred a, an attempt for 30 years and more to try to unify all the forces. Unification is, is a, a standard goal of physics. It's been very successful. Newton unified apples and planets. They have the same motion, same cause for their motion. Although no one was asking him to unify apples and planets. It's a They're, strategy. Yeah. We've learned that it works. You know, nice. uh, you know you, if you understand gravity, it acts on apples and planets. Right. Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism. Particle physics so far has unified quite a bit of the forces, but a unified force is simpler, more symmetric, more explanatory. So that's been a goal. What about We're the fifth force that it. was announced uh, in the last the couple Higgs of weeks? The Higgs is kind of like a fifth force. The Higgs particle and its dynamics. That too would fit in the same picture. So there, there's overwhelming theoretical evidence or clues from nature and our understanding that unification should occur. But how it occurs, you know, we still don't know. So this is, this is the, the, the really the, the complete you know, wanting the beauty and wanting the simplicity. It, it may be that it's not like that. It may, this is a guiding principle from what we have seen, but it may be that this puzzle with gravity is not going to come together with the other three forces in our grand unified uh, dream, let's say. So I think we, we need to keep things in perspective, and because gravity connects with the cosmological constant and the dark matter problem, we kind of need to hold tight on how this picture evolves uh, with, with, uh, with all the forces and with the grand unified theory. Is there a fear that there's some sort of inconsistency when we bring in the Higgs and the math that's associated with it? You're, you're very comfortable. Are you? We're fearless. We, we have fearless. data, absolutely. We measure. Yeah, so you're, yeah. Co you're comfortable, you're fearless, you're skeptical, or <laughs> just waiting for the next book title? Really Speculating to <laughs> beyond. Right, you're fine with it. Are you worried? Uh, well, it's, 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 it's wonderful pieces of the puzzles, and they seem to fit together, but we also know, on the other hand, that the system as it is, is kind of inconsistent. It doesn't work. So right. actually, I think that is uh, terrific. If it would work, you know, we're out of, uh, out of jobs. I think the fact that it's, uh, <laughs> the, it has these little malfunctions, although at very high, high energies, if we just extrapolate, we, just, we, we run into serious troubles. The universe would be unstable. Uh, the, the lots of things are going to blow up. Uh, that just means that there are a few pieces of the puzzle m missing. I, I understand maybe your caution, saying, well, it's, it could be mm -hmm. just this, that mm -hmm. it's in the human mind that we always want to simplify, we want to unify. Sometimes you joke, you know, we can't unify in life, but so perhaps we want all our knowledge to kind of unify. But honestly, if you look at the experimental data, it is pointing in these directions. These forces, if they, in, in our experiments, in our minds, we can move them to higher and higher energy, and they become more and more alike. Uh, and in fact, the point where they start to coalesce is a point that's, you know, it's, it's pointed at by various independent uh, physical experiments. So right. the, the, three of the four. Three, three of the four. Three of the four. Right. Three three of the four. four. Okay, okay. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's um, but, but essentially, describe, any of you, describe the difference. Is, is that jerking around the math to make it look right, or is that uh, basically uh, doing something fundamentally different with the experimental data that actually matches what we see in the world. Maria. Well, 50 years ago, well, it was jerking around, in a way. It was a speculation. And, um, but it turned out that actually even the simplest form remarkably turned out to be quite accurate. Well, yeah, so, 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 so the thing is, is that with, with, uh, you can do a lot of things with math, and, and we have the answer now. When, these were develop when the theory and the symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism, the, when these ideas were developing, they had uh, 
stages of development that took us from ideas about superconductivity and condensed matter system to the vacuum that David explained, the vacuum that we saw earlier. That vacuum didn't look like a nothing or like one state. It looked like an end state thing. It looked like an end body system. And the way the, 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 way the, the whole symmetry breaking mechanism comes together in the unified electroweak theory, or then the young Mills, extending electromagnetism, and the way the Higgs is the, the, the field that turns on, self turns on, there is a phase transition, and based on that you, get, you, give, you leave the photon of electromagnetism as it was massless, and then you give the W and the Z masses, and you give a mass to the, the Higgs is remaining with a mass that you cannot predict, you have to measure. This whole edifice, it took time to be built, it was in the 60s, and people were, um, were kind of going sh on a shot in the dark to, to, put to, to assemble the theory. And the gauge principles and the Goldstone boson and writing the famous potential. David said earlier that it's the laws that are symmetric or the problem that is symmetric, how you set it up. Imagine that you have a, a, a function that has a minimum it's clearly that the, that the realization of the solution will be, if you put in the particle in there, it will stick there. Imagine that you have a more complicated function that has two minima, uh, then you would expect that the, the, the most symmetric solution would be where it's zero. And, and in fact, it's not. It's rolling down. This is the famous Mexican hot potential of the Higgs, and it shows preference. It will go. And there are infinite and states that are going around, and there is this state along the trough that goes along the, 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 the edge that is connected with the Higgs mass. So the whole thing, how it comes together, it took a long time. And of course, um, the, there are many Nobel Prizes that were given for the Higgs. It was the standard model that Weinberg got. It was Nambu. Um, and and uh, now we have the Higgs, which is about the Higgs particle uh, behind the Higgs breaking mechanism or the Higgs-Anderson breaking mechanism of symmetry, of the electroweak symmetry. So the, 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 what, what is a curveball here is that this mass of the Higgs is coming uh, to, to give us more puzzle, and, and uh, uh, Robert alluded to that. With this kind of mass of the Higgs that we have and with the mass of the top that we have measured, these are experimental measurements, if we put those two together, we pred and no other new theory at all, we predict that the universe is going to bubble out in a different universe. And, uh, you know, just like Trump, don't pay your taxes because we're going to go in a different universe. But, but the truth of the matter is, however, that um, it's the case, together with other puzzles about the Higgs that, has to, that have to do um, the, the mass of the Higgs, we haven't measured all of its properties yet. Is it one? Is it more? Do we have signs for extra Higgses, for example, heavier Higgses? All of this is not a settled story, and I, I know that everyone wants the discovery, and they want it fast and faster and faster, uh, which brings us to supersymmetry, which is the way that we hope, this is the equivalent of the Dirac way, that we hope to address an issue of quantum problematics surrounding the Higgs mass. Now we have the Higgs mass. So there, our story, our nominal story, is that we would have for every thing <coughs> on the boson, we would, we would double the particles with partners, with siblings that have different spin. It turns from a half integer spin to an integer spin, and everybody would have a partner like that, and all the quantum problematics about the Higgs mass would be solved, and we haven't found it. We have the Higgs mass, however. So something here is very fishy, to say the least. We, we, something has to be there to settle this, this, uh, this story of the, of the Higgs mass. I just want to say <laughs> Can I make a comment? the most remarkable set of transitions that I've ever heard in, in my Can life. I make one um, go ahead, Alan. The, there was a wonderful moment that happened a few minutes ago, and I don't want it to let, let it go by without noting it. Um, David is a theorist. Maria is an experimentalist. And we were talking about whether gravity can be unified with the other three forces. The other three forces have been unified together in a successful theory. Gravity has not been unified. And David, the theorist, 
said, um, it looks like it's going to happen. Everything that we know in physics says that it's going to happen. He was speaking as a theorist. And Maria said, let's wait and see. <laughs> She's an experimentalist. Um, and I thought that was a profound uh, representation of the different dimensions of science. Uh, the theorists have these wonderful ideas about the way nature should behave. We have ideas of symmetry. We have ideas of beauty. The experimentalists, their attitude is, let's see what the universe is really like. And, and it's, it's often happened in the history of, of, of science that the experimentalists have found something that was unexpected and has sent the theorists back to the drawing board. It's very important to have both the theorists and the experimentalists working together in science and these two people here and their remarks perfectly reflected those two dimensions. Experimentalists and theorists can get along. Oh, sure. Most of the time. Well, we're almost out of time here. Let's uh, take a stab at supersymmetry around the table here before we, before we go. David? So, supersymmetry is a symmetry of space. That hasn't been emphasized. Every particle has a superparticle, but it really, What's most exciting is that it's actually an enlargement of space. Space, time, we all must remember are a mental creation. You've never felt space or observed it directly. It's a concept that infants develop as their brains are developing in their first few months. Just because you won a Nobel doesn't mean you can do psychology and <laughs> neurology too. Uh, psychology is too hard. Nobody understands how they <laughs> infants do this. <laughs> but space and time, we sort of, it's a pretty good picture of the phys physical reality in which we place events. If these guys, I, and I hope they do soon, discover supersymmetry, what they really are discovering is superspace. And superspace is an, an extension of space. It's not like adding ordinary dimensions to space. That might also be the case. This is adding super dimensions, which are measured not with ordinary numbers, but super numbers. And super numbers are different than ordinary numbers because how you multiply the matters. You know, A times B is not B times A, but rather minus B times A. There is a beautiful mathematical structure that, by the way, physicists discovered first, uh, not mathematicians, and that allows us to imagine, as theorists, we haven't yet seen it, put all the theories we've ever had into this larger superspace, and then postulate that the laws of physics are invariant under rotations in the superspace. If they see these particles that this speculation suggests, they will have discovered that we don't live in just in the space and time that infants construct in their first year. We live actually in a much bigger superspace. So it's a profound discovery that we're hoping they make. So talk about what it is you're expecting. What's the experimental uh, agenda right now, results of which you could get in the next few years. Right, so uh, we are running now at the highest energy. It's the, uh, the run two of the Large Hadron Collider uh, at the 13 TV. Uh, we have completed um, a huge number of analyses where we look for supersymmetry. Usually the way you look for supersymmetry is by looking for um, missing energy in the detector more than you, you would expect from the normal uh, sources of missing energy in the detector, which are neutrinos from the standard model. And this and is your baby here. This the, is the, yeah, this is, this is our toy. Um, <laughs> it's 27 kilometers around the Large Hadron Collider between, uh, between France and uh, Switzerland. This is, the, this is the, the, com the compact muon solenoid. It's a, a very compact detector, four 
14,000 tons. It's made of uh, 12 modular elements that we had to put by a crane that is used to, to unearth Pacific uh, um, re relics uh, from, from boats, and we brought it there in, in uh, France, and we brought piece by piece the detector down. Uh, this is about 100 million uh, channels that we take data from this detector. When the protons collide with protons, you've got uh, um, you've got a number of particles that are being created, including the Higgs, for example, and possibly the supersymmetric particles. All of them go through cascade decays that end up with known particles plus uh, what we call the lightest supersymmetric particle that it is weakly interacting like a neutrino, but with a heavy mass, and this is the strongest signature for uh, supersymmetry. We have not found that yet, but we have tantalizing hints uh, which we cannot exactly reconcile, we cannot exactly say what they are, but bear in mind, when we find something, it's not going to have a tag that it's going to say, I am supersymmetric particle. It's not going to be like that at all. It's going to be a very, a very uh, long time, not too long, but very long time before we do the characterization and say, yes, this fits with supersymmetry, or this fits with some other theory, some other heavy particle. But supersymmetry, uh, something that was not said, other than being the big space, mathematically speaking, is, is very beautiful and perfect. And pragmatically speaking, it gives you more than you put in, in terms of parameters. Now, what would be the absolute amazing, of course, uh, wish would be, since in the standard model that we showed earlier, we had fermions and bosons. We had the categories of particles. If they were, why are they not the partners of each other, and then we have supersymmetry and be done? And that is not the case, unfortunately, because all the other quantum numbers are not the same. So we are looking for this bigger supersymmetry that is for all of these particles to have partners, and we have proliferation of partners. Um, now, what we're looking here is a way of doing the analysis. When you do the analysis, you have a background. This is the line that you see there, the blue line, which we calculate either from the theory, Monte Carlo simulations, a lot of computation goes there, and a lot of international collaboration. This is not the product of one person at all. Um, and then you've got the background. Uh, the background is the noise, or is the known stuff that you can characterize. And on top of it, you have something that it is a signal. The signal here is the Higgs, and the signal here is the Higgs in the two photons final state. The Higgs, the particle of the, uh, the, particle of the Higgs field, which is we jiggle at very high energies and we produce it, it decays into two photons. Not only in two photons, but also in two photons. If you take the, the, the energy and momentum conservation, you can take the energies that you measure from the two photons, combine them, and see a little blip, and you see the blip at the mass where the Higgs is, which is 125 plus is, or minus this now. This is the 750. That's the, that's the, if you see the 750 there, imagine that this was the, seven, the, the 125. Now, <laughs> recently, <laughs> And that was how the Higgs was discovered in two photons. Recently in December, we have the same, we go in higher energies than we scan, and we have the same signature, two photons, and we have a blip that shows up at 750 GeV. Is this a new thing? We are, this is, this is where the cliffhanger is of the, when we stopped uh, in 2015 and we started in 2016, and we're going to settle this probably by August, if not by the end of the year, because we have enough data to see if this is sufficient to say Eureka. At the moment, we say this is a tantalizing hint that it, it is a tantalizing hint. This is what we said the first December before the announcement of the Higgs boson. We did not say Higgs Eureka in December of uh, 2011. We said tantalizing hint for the <laughs> Higgs boson because it was around the mass that we had narrowed it should be from other measurements. This thing, we have no idea what to say. It's a tantalizing hint of don't know. But you still. 
You still he need to be... say tantalizing hint to keep the funding going. T tantali yeah. <laughs> tantalizing. Oh, because, uh, the funding yeah. is right. going because the funding has paid itself already by the economic results. Don't get me started on that. I can talk for no, half no, an we hour. Won't. No, 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 no. So, but leave it. Leave us at the cliffhanger. The ultimate sort of the ultimate asymmetry of storytelling is to leave us at a cliffhanger. So it could be, <laughs> it could be anything, including nothing. <laughs> that covers all possibilities. That's perfect. Symmetry. The title, symmetry. the title of Maria's upcoming book will be anything or nothing. Uh, Robert, take us out on the math, and then Alan will get some final thoughts from you. Well, I think actually the uh, what I learned again from this discussion is this incredible power of the concept of symmetry. Uh, from the very beginning, we saw it, uh, and I find it remarkable that you know, if you talk to like artists, they don't dare to use the word beautiful anymore because now is that the role to? We are totally unashamed. We use the word <laughs> all the time, and uh, we we firmly believe in it. And again, you know, it's the it's the force not only that makes us understand the world around us, but it also drives us forward. It's the the big hopes uh, and whatever we'll find in that. Uh, in these new experiments, I think we are totally convinced that again symmetry will play an incredibly important role. And who knows? And with supersymmetry, it's in some sense, as I said, mathematicians have made a menu of all the possibilities. We have seen that we basically ordered all the dishes in the menu except supersymmetry, and it's still out there. And I would love to see it happen. Alan. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just add that. Um, I mean, this symposium is on symmetry, and um, the symmetry uh, in, the, in the last century has been a very powerful guide towards finding new laws of nature. And whether, whether the, the underlying laws are exactly <coughs> symmetrical and there are random fluctuations that make things appear differently, the, the concept of symmetry um, has, has been a powerful guide to discovering new laws. So nature seems to like symmetry at a very fundamental level. Well, uh, how's my hair? Is it symmetric? Because it, <laughs> sometimes it gets lost that way. How, what do we think of this panel here? <laughs> Dr. Gross, Maria, Allen, and Robert, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you.